Hiya, Hugh. Um, welcome to my second podcast or, or podcast on supported employment. Um, could you sort of introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah, I'm Hugh Davis. Uh, I was involved in the predecessor to BASE, the AFSI, the Association for Supported Employment, first as secretary, then chair. And I was heavily involved in the merger with NACE to form BASE in 2005. Um, I was the first chair of BASE for a few years, and uh, we took the step to employ people, and I became chief executive in 2008 until I retired in 2022. It's quite a legacy. Uh, what I thought I'd do is try and take you back into the midst of time when we both had probably sort of better hair than we did now and, and <laughs> sort of not grey beards and grey and white hair. But um ask you, what got you started in supported employment? OK, well, it's, it's a bit of a long story. I'll try and keep it short. Um, I, I started off going to university to do chemical engineering and decided that wasn't for me. I saw the ICI works up in Teesside and thought, never. And I was much more interested in people. Um, and uh, flopped out of university. And uh, my parents bought me a one-way ticket to London to try and find a job. Um, and I ended up doing some volunteering um, through uh, CSV. And I was lucky enough to be a support worker for David Morris, who was became very active in the disability movement in London. Um, he was working for the Office of Fair Trading at the time. He later became advisor to the mayor of London on disability issues. And it was an eye opener spending time with him on holidays around the country, going to the local pub, just seeing how people reacted and related to him. And he basically taught me most of what I know about the values of disability. Um, I got involved in um, group living in London. People resettled from hospital. Um, and when I moved up north to Bury, um, got a job with a community housing scheme as a senior carer, and we resettled people from Long Stay Hospital. Um, did that for a few years and then got a job at a day centre and did my social work qualification. And one of the placements was about doing an assessment and a care plan for somebody at the day centre. And he turned around and said, I'd like to work. Well, that threw me. But we looked at the sort of support that was around for him and basically discovered there was nothing. So um, we did some research. We um, started talking to people across the three day centres in Bury. We got them together in focus groups and meetings. Um, we got somebody in to draw up their thoughts about what they wanted to keep from their current lifestyles, what they wanted to dump, what they wanted for the future that, that wasn't available now. And we wrote all this up in, um, I suppose, drawing form around the walls um, of a meeting room. And we invited the chair of social services, who later became local MP, um, and a couple of other uh, people along to listen to a presentation. And uh, the other thing I did was organize a local conference on supported employment. Got people like Doug Cresswell involved, Tom Jackson, um, and uh, I've still got a piece of paper written by the uh, a, a flyer for that event and written on it in, in bold pen is a comment from the director of social services to the assistant director saying, what the hell's going on here? Get a grip of it. Um, <laughs> so I'm quite proud of that. Anyway, we put a lot of pressure on um, both through staff, through people who use the services, through parents and so on. And uh, the council agreed to pilot a supported employment service in Bury. Um, I applied for it, not thinking I'd get it, but I was lucky enough to be offered the job. So that was back in 1994, um, 93, 94. Um, we started very small with just a couple of staff. Uh, we inherited an ESF project, which stated we were going to deliver 20,000 hours of training at two pound an hour. So wow. said, that's never going to work. So we we handed that back um, and, and cracked on from there, really. 
um, and I suppose the, the service developed over time. We were very lucky that we inherited as well. The council had a very, very small work step contract with about two people on it, but it got us in the door of government funded programs. Um, and we built on that. Uh, we started doing European funded transnational work. Um, and it eventually became a pan disability service, but we also supported young people leaving care. We supported refugees. Uh, we supported people with alcohol and drug problems. We did work with GP surgeries locally on job retention, particularly around mental health at work. Um, so, yeah, that's how it developed. It's very interesting. I was speaking to Kimberly Charman, who's who started Status. And it's interesting, you've got the same sort of values that she had in the fact that she was working in a day centre. She was looking at people who were wanting to find jobs and finding the same things that actually there were no, there was no one to help them. And if we were going to get a jobs, we were going to have to start. I, I was very fortunate because I actually applied for a job for Blake's Wharf Employment Service, and it was one of the first ones. So I was in the lucky crowd that actually went directly into an organisation that was set up purely by default. I mean, I think that the, the lady who started Jane Middleton tricked everyone by saying it was going to be a day centre, and then the last minute then said, no, actually, it's going to be an employment service. And I think that was, for me, I was lucky, but... You know, the people like yourself and Kimberly, where you had to fight to get those services. Yeah. And the fact that anyone could think about putting something there about get a grip on, on, on yourself, I think, you know, I think that was probably going to be impossible. Um, <laughs> it's um, been a, re a repeating theme, I, th I think. That I, I, I probably saying, get a grip on me. <laughs> But, I mean, uh, obviously, you you had your employment service, which I, I remember in Borough, and it, it started a number of great employment services really across the northwest. And I think yeah. in the northwest was quite a hotbed at the time of supported employment. Yeah. And I can still remember going to a sort of smoky hotel room somewhere in Manchester, Stockport, somewhere, I don't know, because um, Manchester sort of blends in sometimes for me, where I think was the starting of AFC. Um, were you involved in that or was that before? No, AFC had been going, I think, since about the mid-80s. Um, I, I got it mid late 80s to early 90s. Yeah, yeah. I have to say that when we started, I hadn't got a clue what I was doing. I had no idea at all. Um, and it was very much a case of trying to find out how other people did the role. Um, I, I I went on a placement to, I think it was to Rochdale, um, as part of my social work qualification, to the employment team there, um, and was told uh, you 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 can't have any contact with employers. So that placement finished very quickly, and I went up to Preston. Uh, doing some work with a community group there called Integrate. And that's where I found the first job for somebody, a uh, young man with autism. We got him a job at the cinema. Um, I, 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 I do think in the, the late 80s, we were all feeling our way. When I started at Blake's War, there was no, there was no TSI. There was no map of what you needed to do for oh. vocational profile. There had been in America, and it, it took to 1988 in the UK before Mark Gold Associates came over, and yeah. it got to be actually, this is actually good practice, and this is the way that you should be doing it. I think, I remember Sarah Woodin was very active around TSI at that time. Um, yeah, Sarah Woodin from Blake's. So she 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 was the deputy manager at the time from Blake's War. Okay, okay. I, we were lucky. You're right that the Northwest was a bit of a hotbed of supported employment. Um, I was particularly lucky to know Doug Cresswell. Um, he'd worked originally with the Mencap Pathway um, scheme, which is one of the first in the country. Uh, and he'd set up Pure Innovations in Stockport. So he very kindly let us borrow his paperwork and policies. Um, and, and we put them in place. He was really helpful with guidance and um we worked on those adapted them and and showed them to doug one day and he said well 
can we have them back and can we use yours? And and that's what but, it was like in those days. But, you know, but, but isn't that what supported him? Isn't that what supported employment is? Is that we've I, always sort of swapped ideas and been generous with our knowledge with each other if we're yeah. all working in the same way. Yeah, I, I, we weren't in competition with each other. We each had our own patch, and I think that was key to that collaboration that we weren't competing you know, for yeah. jobs or funding against each other. So that worked well. And then, you know, there was the formation of the Northwest Supported Employment Initiative as a way of linking everybody together. And that's probably how I heard about AFSI for the first time. Doug, Doug persuaded me to go to a conference in Manchester, AFSI conference, um, I think around 98, something like that, 97. Um and and yeah, it was an eye opener, an eye opener. I think I think that was in my wilderness years, and and and, and you are for me responsible for bringing me back into AFC. I, I I'd got to a stage where I sort of not fallen out, but just sort of got on with my own things, and 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 it seemed to be that AFC wasn't building what I needed, but then. That's when your name and other people's names uh, started cropping up, and yeah. um, it'd be nice to your understanding of of how because I think AFSI took that re resurgence when when you came on board and and actually had a new life. Well, I think we had a coup, really. Um, one of the I I I would say that the key figure responsible who laid the ground for base coming along later was a woman called Chrissy Heaselwood, who worked at Wigan and Lee College. She ran their supported employment team. Um, and Chrissy was involved in AFSI. She was the secretary and she took minutes of meetings. We all, remember none of us were ever quite sure what AFSI was about and what it was trying to do and what it was aiming at. I think quite a few of the people involved in AFSI at the time came from a background of day service modernization um sort of real lives type initiative and um meetings you know we we we'd get these minutes and and i i knew chrissy well and talked with her off the record about things and you know what seemed to be happening was they'd meet up every once in a while remember there, were, there was no resources you know there was no paid staff there was there was it was all voluntary and they'd meet up sort of quarterly or something or every couple of months for a day and um i think the meetings got to the point really where where most of the meeting was looking at the minutes of the meeting before i i and, sort of remember no them talking room. about chocolate biscuits and things like yeah. that I, there was I no remember room losing... for any yeah. there was no room for any planning no room yeah. for any anything to happen in in the meetings and chrissy bless her i think she got fed up with it well she started typing up the minutes verbatim yeah. um, so and then uh, distributed them to the members so we could all see what was going on in the meeting word for word uh and it, it was immensely frustrating so i i sort of decided to get involved with afsi to help chrissy because i felt that she was battling on her own to try and steer the organization to being a bit more proactive and a bit more organized so that's how I got involved. Um, there, there were several meetings. It became apparent there was a, a lottery bid, which had been successful, that AFSI was meant to be delivering. We couldn't see any records of anything to do with the delivery. Um, so there were a few desperate communications with the lottery board. Um, I'm not quite sure how that got resolved in the end, but uh, it did end up with several people leaving AFSI. Yeah, I, I think that's probably when I, I, I came in contact. I, I'd been told, uh, the conference before I went to in Nottingham, I'd been told that there was a conference in Bournemouth. It wasn't a reliable source for, for me, but he did say the AFSI conference was really good. And, and I'd taken over status and, and I'd had got huge problems in status myself. But one of the things they'd written to the business plan is that I had to attend the conference and deliver a workshop at the Nottingham conference, which I, I have to warn anyone, never take a drink with Hugh Davis because it's the equivalent of the King's shilling. Because 
after in, in that is that's when I met you. I was having a pint, and that, that's when you said, "Would you mind joining the board?" It would only be for about six months or a year at the most, and and here I am, nearly twenty years later, talking yeah. to. You. Yeah, well, you weren't alone with that. There was a lot of dragooning people to get involved. Uh, Kathy Melling, Doug Cress, well, a whole bunch of people, really, Tom Jackson. Um, and and yeah, I, I, I really... needed a fresh start, do you know what yeah. I mean? And I, I think I, I I was persuaded to to be secretary of AFSI uh, 2000 to 2001 and thought, we've got to get better at organising ourselves. And I thought, right, I'm going to put on a conference. So you remember I was talking about our local chair of the social service. Yeah. Well, by this point, he was um, a junior minister in the Department for Education, and his responsibility was around careers and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I persuaded him to come to the conference and speak. We, we actually had two ministers at that conference in Bournemouth. I think it was the very first time we'd got a stage with a backdrop behind it <laughs> and and it was a proper conference i, I would always think that the professionalism i always remember and, and you probably remember this story is um, i don't know whether you've ever seen kez where they all the school children are getting told off and, and there's a little boy who gets told off who, who wasn't even responsible i felt a little bit like that on on one of the mornings where it was the 2003 conference in nottingham and we were all being told off because the conference had said the 2002 conference. And I felt like the boy in in, in, the, <laughs> in the area because you were saying, we've got to be more professional than this. And I, I, I'm sure that was starting that road of actually, um, we'd always prouded ourselves of being on the hippie bus, but actually, actually, yes, we need to be free spirits. We need to be hippies, but we also need to be organised. And I, and, and I think I put a lot of that down to yourself, actually honing a lot of people with their own individual ideas into... I, I, I think my ethos was always attention to detail, mm. you know? Um, apart from that flyer with the wrong year on it, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was about attention to detail. It was the little things that make a, an experience for people to come to. I wanted people to come and go, right, I'm part of a movement, I'm part of this, you know, yeah. and to get more people involved. And, I, I, yeah, it did change mindset, I think, when we did. Yeah, and we, I remember soon after that we had a big planning day, and, and I think that started, in a way, the road to base that we are now, and, and, and that sort of becoming a broader church which i think has had much more of an important political voice and, and, and improved quality standards right across the board yeah i i think work step coming in made a big difference as well um before it had been the sheltered employment scheme or uh, it no, was a sheltered uh, placement scheme it was called sheltered placement scheme um and it, it was called supported employment for a while by government, some of that. Um, and of course it wasn't. But work step meant that we were dealing with the same paperwork and the same issues as NACE and their members were dealing with from a factory perspective. Um, and it didn't make any sense that they were meeting with government and we were meeting with government. And we, we were basically discussing the same concerns and issues. So... In a sense, it was the work step program that that laid that that ground for for us talking to each other and finding out yeah. you know what we had in common and um, and I, I remember when we merged, so many people said no, it would be the end of I've seen it would be the end of everything. But I think yeah, we had a couple of difficult years, but actually I think both organisations, in my opinion, I think both organisations got stronger by listening to each other and actually coming out with a common purpose yeah and think... there had to be a bit of give and take and a bit of you know we had to ease ourselves into it really there were concerns people had absolutely you know but that i think there was a core group of people on both sides so looking at nice i'm thinking about um martin davis mm. jane collinson robert fairburn to some extent dave honeybell you know that those people yeah. were um, they were instrumental. In we you. wanted it to work, and and they were they were in the business for the right reasons. Do you know what I mean? And and we had that in common, really. I think. 
I, th I think this is the biggest thing is everyone I know who has gone on with supported employment mm -hmm. and, and the bottom end is their values is around about helping people with disabilities get employment. And that's been the most important aspect. Often people have come from it in different ways, but that's been, I think, the driving force of anything that we've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of want to bring you back a little bit is because during that time is everyone will know me and you as sort of, um, the, um, the 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 Waldorf of of the EUSC because I mean it was in two thousand and four I think or two thousand five we we ended up and we started our Euro, um, European Union supported employment journey and, and and we we came back into into the fold there as well. Yeah, that we had. I can't remember whether we had been involved as AFSI earlier we, we've been involved and then i think we'd misbehaved we as, as, as a country it's it sort of reminiscent of brexit now i think we'd misbehaved yeah. and, and we were asking that it made more sense to be back in the fold again and 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 for some absurd reason me and you were sent to actually do that um and <laughs> it was in barcelona and before the barcelona conference that we we got involved in it and yeah and straight um, in on developing the european toolkit i suppose or the, it, it the was a quality there. standards to begin with we had a it was a pre-quality standards before the quality standards that you know now as seqf but it was the first time i think that people were writing down what sh what was good not just in britain but right across europe and i uh, i think we learned very heavily uh, how we could get european involvement yeah yeah good times and and Good to see the bigger picture. You know, I've always felt like it's important to look around, see what how other people are doing things, ask mm. questions, and and part of that, that's probably partly why I got involved in AFSI, and and it's, I think it's why I got involved in the European side as well. It, it's just great to widen your network and to learn off each other. You know, there's always something. You always came back with something new. Yeah, you know, and, and and I think having both base and user to actually ways that people could work and, and in different ways, we actually started getting products for the first time. And I think those products, looking back on it now, those products are the sort of skeleton that we, we, we needed. We, we, we never had any bones in supported employment. It was only, oh, well, if you ask this person, they would know. And I think now as we go into the 2020s we've actually got quite a lot of really good products yeah yeah i, I think my biggest re regret really one of the biggest regrets is that we never were able to host the european conference in britain yeah and it never felt like we had a stable enough politics really in britain to be able to do that where we could count on government support um no, and I think that if, is something... If you look back over the last 12 years, we've, we've probably had about nine or ten ministers for disabled people, Yeah, if not more. Sometimes you, that you lose count. I mean, sometimes you get disabled ministers leave and then two ministers later they come back again and you think, I'm sure I've seen that person before. <laughs> and and, and I, I do think it's an issue is you look at some uh, other countries and, and how their countries really embrace the idea of having supported employment. And, and I think it's a challenge for the UK is that, for me, um, for governments to actually say what they mean on the tin, because we are, often have meaningless phrases that don't go anywhere. You know, we're going to half the disability gap. And then that gets watered down is we're going to shorten the disability gap, which is then going to be back to will new election will halve the disability gap and 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 not actually having meaningful changes. Um, and we're, and that, that's we're a, worry a country. For me. We're a country of slogans, aren't we, from politicians? And it's yeah. almost as if you if you say them often enough, well, they've got to happen, haven't they? Yeah, I don't think they realise that you've got to put the work in and have the strategy behind it, an action plan. To, to make it happen you know what one of the things that i think really helped i'm thinking back to 2007 thereabouts now was the local um uh, joint planning groups what were they called the um 
Oh. Strategic partnership. Yeah. So you would have strategic partnerships in learning disabilities yeah. and mental health. So for every local authority you had to have that group linking people together. And, and for the very first time, you had people from education talking to people in social care, talking to people in employment. And, and we all had our own jargon. We all had our own language. And for the first time, we had to find a common language and everyone understand each other's role and what we were doing. I, I think, think it was a time about them, yeah. 12 years ago when it was looking really hopeful that you would get um, joint services looking at how they would improve their disability employment. Yeah. And it was, unfortunately, it seemed to be, and it seems to happen in our country, new 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 governments come in and they want to throw away anything that is the old government, even if it was good practice, it seems to be thrown out. And we haven't had that. And with austerity, I think, in the UK, I, it means that it's always been put on the back burner since then. But I, I, I remember a, a lot of time. Uh, just want to bring you a little bit back to base and the, the, the way that you've developed and, and And now that we have base and inclusive trading that actually does an awful lot of training, uh, my memory of the starting of the training really was a person that I know is dear to your heart, and, and that is uh, Fred. Um, and Fred, I, uh, I mean, you can explain Fred oh. far better than me, but I mean, I think he was an inspiration for base, and I think it's, yeah. you know, someone that we should always remember because of the way he moved us forward. Yeah, and he's an inspiration for me. Um Fred was uh, oh, he's a self-employed businessman. He he started off with market stalls. He he he'd always worked for himself throughout his life, um, and um, he 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 ended up running a, a fish and chip shop in town. He developed an MVQ for fish frying. I think it was the first time there'd been an MVQ for that. Um, and he got involved with some partners to to build a, a wider network of fish and chip shops. And his partners were mainly sleeping partners and he was doing all the work and it was just burning him out. So um, just around that, he was he was chair of the governors at the local college. He was president of the local chamber of trade. He knew all the local politicians. Um, councillors and so on. He was extremely well connected with his business being in the centre of town. So everyone knew him. Everyone loved him. Um, larger than life character. Um, and he'd, he'd offered us a couple of paid jobs for our clients. Um, he, he offered regular work experience and tasters for people. Um, he had a really good attitude as well around it. He recognised the value um people with disabilities brought to his organization and the learning that he, he he could get from that to develop the business so he saw it on the economic side of it the economic benefits of it directly um but one day he rang me up and um said uh I'm, I'm chucking it in i'm chucking in the fish and chip business um i'm applying for a job i've never applied for a job before um can you pop up my house and help me write the application and a CV. Um, so I went up to see him and said, what are you applying for? And it was a housing advice officer. And I thought, well, what on earth are you doing that for, Fred? Come and work for us. So um, I employed him. Initially, the only way I could do it was as an employment officer. Um, but we would bid for some European funding. And, and within a couple of months, I had the funding to, to set him up as a lead on employer engagement. Uh, and he was fantastic at it. And as part of that, he developed a set of, he developed training for our team and um, we saw the value of it and how effective it was. So we decided to sell that training to other services and we must have, well, we sent him all over the country with his suitcase um, and he must have delivered it to about 80 different services, I think. And it is a lot of the content is still reflected in, in the training the base delivers today. Um, because it, it it was good I, training. It, without 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 Fred's involvement, um, inclusive trading would never have happened. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it was it was a bit that we had to think differently. Obviously, 
you know, when, when, when Fred left us, um, sadly, we had to think differently. And for us to do that, that's when the model of having associates and, and we've got some tremendous associates, including yourself now, on on inclusive trading. And, and I think that that model that 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 legacy he left was a legacy that has allowed us to look at how we improve agencies quality how we improve their training, how we can give them access to good quality training and recognised training. I think that's a legacy, but it's a legacy between not you, not just Fred, but you and Fred, I think is something that is, is, is really important. Sort of links back to this idea of sorting AFSI out in the very first place. Yeah. It's about professionalising the sector. Yeah. We were seen as a bunch of do-goody-gooders, social workers, meddling in employment. That's how employers saw us a lot, I think, at that time. Not not the best services. The best services were, were, you know, they were clear about the business case for employers and all the rest of it. But there were a huge number of services around the country just muddling through without any really clear idea of what they were doing. And they were in, you know, there was danger of giving it a bad reputation. I, I just want to bring you back to the context of the 2000s, because I think there was stability enough then with valuing people, yeah. valuing employment and, and that. Um, the sort of go ahead that we had from government to to mm. to, to look at this to to understand the, the local situations uh, and look at the scale of what needed to happen. In. We had local area agreements. We had indicators for the four most marginalised groups in employment. So youngsters, um, youngsters leaving care, um, recovering drug users. I think was one of them. Um, I was it? No, it wasn't. It was ex offenders. Um, there was one for mental health and one for learning disabilities. And local authorities had to report outcomes against those targets. Um, and I, I think that sort of paved the way for us to the, the door was open for us to knock on, you know, locally, strategically. But there were two, I think there have been two major points in. in based his life really that have made a difference and both have been gambles one of them was in 2007 saying or 2008 saying right we're going to have to take the risk we're going to have to employ somebody if we're going to develop the organization it needs somebody paid there to be have the time to put into it to do it so that was a big gamble for us you know it could have finished us off really if it hadn't worked out The second one was around, you'll remember, around 2013 or so, 2012, where we weren't far off bankruptcy. We had very little money in the the account, and we we took a risk around developing qualification and developed the certificate course. Well, that is what has allowed us to have the resources to develop base really taking that step it was a huge gamble at the time but it's really paid off yeah and it's part of that professionalization that we were looking to do so what are the keys the keys are you know uh, the keys are national occupational standards what are the skills what's the knowledge needed to be a good employment officer so you've got that individual level of skills and knowledge needed. Then you look at, right, how do we help staff to, to get that? You deliver a recognised accredited qualification that allows them to do that. Okay, so now we've got qualified staff, but employers, what are they looking at? How do they know if a service is any good or not? I, I've always thought we desperately need a kite mark for services so that employers understand what they're getting involved in, what they can expect. You know, there's some assurance from a kite mark. Employers are asking for a kite mark. And that's where the quality standards, SEQF, has come from, really. And I'd love to see it develop further into a proper monitored and managed kite mark system. And I, I think this is where the mixture between BASE and EUSC comes in, because without EUSC, there wouldn't be no SEQF. Uh, but without base actually developing that SEQF into a products and services that, that can actually actually be audited, I think it's a bit of both, and I think that's that learning from each other, and, and I think it's it's been really important. By the way, this is my last year as treasurer 
of, oh. of, of base. Um, far, I, I don't know when you persuaded me to become treasurer. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I do remember the sort of 2013 and I think we got to the stage of just about having enough to pay wages, but not in, you know, it, it, it was a gamble. And I think Martin Davis was in, a big instrument in, in actually helping us survive that. And you were right. It was from that Cardiff conference that we managed to have Margaret Haddock come along, talk about quality standards at the time, but actually find some money um, from, I think it was the West Country, to develop the national occupational standards that we have today, which started the training and started that, that professionalism, oh, which yeah, I think is so important. Yeah, it was the Learning and Skills Council, wasn't it? We, I think so. Yeah. Or LSIP, one of them. I, I can't quite remember. Um, and and obviously, I mean, that's a big thing. Is that I, I remember giving you a sort of conversation at the last conference where I, I I was doing a little bit being funny about you and SEQF but that quality standards runs through you like a stick of rock it's 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 a bit that makes it so important it's a it's a bit that actually you've talked about I remember from about 2004 the quality standards and it's I think it's it, it's something that I think defines you within supported employment yeah i suppose it helps that i've been through it if you remember back to work step we got the adult learning inspector yeah. involved from government involved in in inspecting services and it was the first time we've been inspected we had to do self-assessment reports what a shock that was personally we discovered that, that the service i managed in berry was rubbish absolute rubbish through a self-assessment we thought we were brilliant we discovered when we looked at the evidence at the data that we were rubbish and what you know the danger is everyone told you oh you're fantastic you're fantastic social service so social care inspector used to just stick their head around the corner and say oh you've got an employment service tick yeah and that's brilliant well done you guys the adult learning inspector were looking at how we did things they looked in drilled down in detail at how we were doing things so it, it took us about it probably took us two years to get the service right, you know, to have the policies in place, to have the systems for checking it, the compliance of practice against the policies, for being able to collect the data and, and analyze it and interpret it through reports to tell us about trends, to get that feedback loops. Um, all of these things, probably about two years to, to put in place and to get the service to the point where, you know, luckily we got the outstanding with Pure Innovations and, and the rest of the consortium for work step. Um, it, it's critical if, you know, you, it's about continuous improvement. And I always managed the supported employment service in Berry as a business. You know, I'd built up a, a slush fund, a fighting fund of a couple of hundred thousand you know, we, we ran it as a business commercially. Um, but underpinning all of that was, was you know, quality was paramount because our customers, whether they were job seekers, whether they were employers, in a sense, I almost treated the commissioners as customers. You know, they had their needs. I had to, I had to be proactive with commissioners. You know, too many people sit back and, and wait to get clobbered by commissioners telling them how big the cut's going to be next year. Mm. We've got to be much more proactive and say, give us this and this is what we can deliver you for you. Um, so. so this runs me on to more or less my, my last type of question in a way is that you've now sort of hung up your boots just about, although you, you, you're doing lots of good sort of audit work for inclusive trading and lots of associate work in, in training still. Uh, but last time I saw you, you were in your camper van. And I suspect yeah. it, it's it's looking at sort of looking now at supported employment in the future. And, and one of the things that you were always very good at at conferences is actually looking at challenges ahead. And I suspect really it's for people to be your views of what the challenges are for supported employment, because I think they're myriad going forward. Yeah. But I'd like to know your views of what challenges supported employment has going forward. Well, firstly, I think it's important to realise how far we've come and, and the current state of things. You know, we've got Laura doing a fantastic job as chief executive now with BASE. You've got 
from what I, I see a, a sort of dividing between the commercial side of inclusive trading and, and the the charitable lobbying side of base, there's clear purpose there. There's a strategy underpinning it. Um, I think the handover worked out really well in terms of timing because Nerys and Laura were involved in the new bids and they were going to have to deliver them anyway. So they they shaped them. Um, and, and we've got a lot of investment in the sector now through, through education and through um, Department of Work and Pensions. It all bodes well, but we've got to connect with the people coming into this sector as workers. You know, we've got to make sure they start right, that they get it. And, mm. and that's about the training, I think, and getting that right for people and keep it's about hammering away all the time, hammering away in terms of professionalization of those working in the sector, but also that engagement of the policymakers at government to make sure that things continue with 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 some certainty in a set direction. You know, the danger is that we pivot back and forth between in 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 terms of policy making from government. We've got um the uh, trials of, of um, government funding, local authority-based provision. So the local supported employment initiative means that, for, as far as I can see, for the very first time, government is giving funding to provision which they do not commission themselves. It's being commissioned by local authorities. And if you remember back, I'll take you back to 2010 when we had a, an outgoing Labour junior minister telling us about how wonderful work choice was going to be with the 28 commercial contracts, big geographical areas. And I, I do remember this. I do. You know, I, I accused him of potentially decimating the sector. And I, I, I still stand by that to this day. I don't think it was a good thing. But what we've done is go full circle back to local provision because if you deliver this sort of service, you've got to be in touch locally with employers, yep. understand the local labor market, go out. These are not people who walk into job centers. We have to go to them. If, you, if you look at when we first started and I was in the London Southeast region, you were in the sort of Manchester Northwest region and you said something right at the beginning of this. And that was that we weren't in competition with each other. We worked actually together. And that's how we worked in London. We never worked in competition with other boroughs, but we actually learned from each other. And, and, and the same was in Manchester. It's about the values. And for yeah. me, it's always been about if I can help someone in a different borough, a different country, a different county, it yeah. doesn't matter to me because it means people with disabilities go and get proper open employment. Oh, and that's what it's about. That, that for me, has been my driving force. And I think... Within all of those, is that that values to me is the important thing that drives all of us. How we get to that is is in different ways sometimes. Yeah, there's a danger that it plays second fiddle to commercial considerations yeah. if we're not careful. You know, so it's it's hanging on to those values and putting them first. Yeah. Um, and and I think we're clear about what works. We've just got to persuade some of the people in in government that it's the right thing we used to take ministers out we used to take mps and um, senior officials out to see services to talk to employers to talk to and you, you know the, the thing that's going to be important to hang on to is that the biggest advocates of what we do apart from people with disabilities themselves is their families and their employers and yeah. we've got to harness that better because i think the will is there from families and from employers to work with us to get the right sort of policy, you know, environment to to to, to let us do what we want to do. I there's a new program out now, universal support, cool. and I'm very unclear how that's going to work and how that's going to be delivered. It's being described as a supported employment program. Um, we'll see. I I'm I'm not up to speed. I'm out the loop about how that's being going to be commissioned and so on i hope it will be done locally and not of big geographical areas yeah. because i can't see how it can be a supported employment program if it's being delivered over multiple local authority areas so that that worries me um the problem is the people making the decisions about these things know actually very little about supported employment 
you know. Yeah. No, but I, 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 I think, I mean, I on, on that, it's, it, it's, I've always described this as like pushing a boulder up a hill. And, and you know, we've always need many people pushing that boulder. And just because we are sort of getting to that age where we can no longer be in the forefront of it, it's really important those people at the forefront keep that sort of bit beacon going and, and, and keep that light going and keep pushing that boulder up the hill. Yeah, I think we should give an, an honourable mention to Hugh Pollinger at yeah. Department of Work and Pensions because, you know, he, he was a consistent supporter and point of senior contact for us in the department who has definitely been instrumental in guiding policy in the right direction. I, I don't think we'd be where we are now if it wasn't for Hugh Pollinger. So, um, yeah. I think like ending on you congratulating someone for the DWP should be really the Department of Work and Pensions changed, should be eh? a good way to end 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 this. So thank you, well, it, that's it, wonderful, it, and and thank you for, the, us, for your insights. It does take us on a little bit from the commercial manager demanding I be sacked, doesn't it? It does. So yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers, Cheers Robert. Good to talk to you.